Hey everyone, welcome to another midweek conversation as we talk about this past Sunday's message, the readings for the week, the, the challenge for the week as we seek to apply it and grow or really whatever else pops up in the course of conversation. Um, so this past Sunday we resumed our series, we had the one-off break where we had a guest speaker talking about evangelism uh, and then we resumed our series in Exodus. We, we've just come out of this section detailing a lot of the tabernacle and now we are back to seeing God's people kind of interact with him in a much more corporate um, setting. And so you've got Moses up on the mountain, the people go to Aaron, have him make the gold calf. Moses comes down and that saga unfolds. And so we looked at three key components of Exodus 32 Related to that, we're reading uh, Judges 2, 2 Samuel 12, and Psalm 89 as we consider the topics of forgetfulness, what specific kinds of forgetfulness the Bible identifies as plaguing God's people and the consequences of each of those kinds of forgetfulness, looking at the reality that we just can't blame other people for our sin. And unfortunately, it's been the model that was established all the way back in the Garden of Eden and we continue to perpetuate today. And then the third component, which is convicting and encouraging simultaneously that just because we are saved and we are God's people doesn't mean we have some sort of magical immunity to the consequences of our sin in the day-to-day life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And just because we experience consequences of our sin doesn't mean that God's faithfulness is somehow diminished in any way. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so each of the readings will touch on different of those. Some of them overlap and and touch on all three of those. Uh, But before we dive into the readings, any questions, any comments, thoughts from the sermon? Yeah, just... It's actually a couple questions, but okay. to to follow up first on the topic of forgetfulness, because we see that, I mean, plain and simple. It's really funny, just the phrase of, like, they didn't just forget God. They also kind of forgot about Moses, because yeah. they're like, uh, we don't know what happened. We don't know why. Well, he's, he's gone. You know, like, they see him walk up the mountain. They're like, who knows what went down up there? So let's just p- move on from Moses. Um, but on the topic of forgetfulness, what would be maybe some tips for you, some things to, some ironically, some things to remember about kind of battling forgetfulness. You know, we do, like we forget so quickly, so easily. It's a daily thing. So so I will, I'll piggyback, I'll kind of expand on. So at the end of the sermon, you know, we do the this week, let's all the reading, the remembering, the reflecting and Mm -hmm. stuff. And so in that, I kind of threw out a couple ideas of very practical ways, right? If, If you're someone who forgets, Gratitude. If you forget the source of, and that sounds bad, but if we're honest, I think a lot of us struggle with forgetting to be grateful Mm -hmm. because we've gotten so used to, you know, for example, I, I did not have a conscious thought up until this very moment of, Hey, I drove safely to work this morning. Mm -hmm. That's a gift from God. You know what I mean? Why? Because I expect to get to where I'm driving safely. Mm -hmm. And so up until this moment, I truthfully can tell you, unfortunately, that I, I did not have a moment of gratitude of like, Oh, I pulled into the parking lot. Lord, thank you that my car started. Mm -hmm. Thank you that I had gas in the tank because I have money to put gas in the tank. Mm -hmm. Thank you that I was able to drive on roads that are not all blown up and cratered. And you know what I mean? Like my commute is not an hour and a half, even though it's only two miles. Like there's so many things to be thankful for just on my drive to work. Mm -hmm. And it's just not at the forefront of my mind to say, wow, you need to acknowledge that all of this that has already happened just in leaving your home and pulling into the office Those are all gifts from God. Mm -hmm. And so I challenge everybody said, hey, if you're somebody who forgets gratitude, uh, just write down, try and write down as many things as you can think of to be thankful for. I've done this exercise at different times in my life. I've taken a day or or an hour in the evening or something and just really focused on, because I get it, your boss probably wouldn't be thrilled if you ignored the assembly line to sit down and just write. So I do it in the evening at home, but right, sit down and literally, like literally see how many things you can possibly think of to be grateful for. Like, mm-hmm. don't leave until you have run out of ideas. Right. Right. Um, and then take that list and put it somewhere. Put it somewhere where you can easily access it. Take a picture mm-hmm. of it. Put it on your phone. So you have it at your on your phone. You have it at home. Um, I said, you know, if you're someone who forgets God's statutes and God's care, I didn't say this, but if you're someone who forgets God's statutes and God's commands, God's word, God call, mm-hmm. God's call to holiness, Pick out a couple key verses that speak to sanctification, his call in our lives to be holy. Put them on note cards. Tape them on your mirror. Tape them. Uh, my wife does a great job of putting, anytime she's trying to memorize or internalize a certain passage, she'll put it on a note card and she'll put it 
on the bathroom mirror, on, on her dresser mirror. Mm -hmm. She'll put it like over the kitchen sink or somewhere in the kitchen where we are regularly. She'll tape it next to the doorways in our house. So mm -hmm. when you leave the house, you see a note card with scripture on it and you're like, mm -hmm. all right, like do stuff like that. Um, the other uh, one I gave was, you know, if, if you are someone who forgets zeal, right? You've, you've lost that passion. You've lost that fire. That first section in Deuteronomy we looked at, what was tied to, for, to losing passion and zeal was a forgetfulness of God's testimony. Mm -hmm. And so I said, write down, you know, 10, five things, three things of, hey, this, this time in my life is clear testimony of God's mercy. This time in my life is clear testimony of God's provision. Mm -hmm. And again, put that somewhere where you can access it easily. And it goes back to uh, a sermon that we actually did last Christmas season, just a brief one-off language of the Bible. And, and I had, I asked our worship team to lead us in, come now fount. Mm -hmm. And the second, the second line of that song starts with here, I raise my Ebenezer. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was like, well, how many of us sing here? I raise my Ebenezer and I have no clue what an Ebenezer is. Mm -hmm. You go back to the old Testament and the people were constantly making physical monuments of remembrance. Right. And it says every time they're called to make a monument of remembrance or they do, it's always tied to so that future generations will see this and will ask, hey, what's that mean? And so I think that's a mm -hmm. very practical thing from the life of the people in the Old Testament that we can take with us today. And let's not be afraid to use our physical house, our, our physical car, our physical bedroom. Like what... What could possibly be a negative side effect of putting physical, visible, tangible reminders in our mm -hmm. lives of praise, of worship, of dependence on the Lord? You know what I mean? So it's like, hey, when I see that, I'm reminded of God's testimony. When I see that, I'm reminded of God's faithfulness. When mm -hmm. I see that, I'm reminded to be grateful. Like, I think we need to be willing to do the things that sound a little odd, right? Like yeah. if you're talking to an unbeliever and you're like, oh yeah, you know, I put these note cards all up or, you know, like I raised a little, like it's the stuff that you're like, oh, come on. There's one of those kooky Christian ideas, mm -hmm. right? But why, why would we not want to put physical reminders in our lives to help combat forgetfulness if that's what it takes? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're someone who it, it, you are much more intrinsically geared. I'm not going to say intrinsically motivated or extrinsically motivated. I don't think it's a matter of motivation. I think it's a matter of what resonates with our personality and our temperament. Mm -hmm. If you're someone who's much more intrinsically geared, you know, maybe you can wake up and you can just tell yourself, hey, mentally I set an alarm clock so that when I wake up, I identify three things to be grateful for, mm -hmm. right? Maybe you don't need the physical reminder. Mm -hmm. For you, it's more of a mental reminder. Or for you, it's a, you know what? Our family is going to build, maybe it's not a physical reminder, but instead your family is going to build this habit of when we sit down around the dinner table together, we're all going to go around and identify two things we're grateful for that day. Mm -hmm. And then we can hear the testimony of each other's lives as well, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe that's it. Um, but I would say all of those can be very practical, very hands-on, very tactile means of combating forgetfulness, which a lot of times is what people are looking for. It's okay. We, we hear the theology, we hear the intellectual side, right? Like how can I actually translate this into the nitty gritty details yeah. of my daily life? Yeah, exactly. There, Martin Luther used to say that we need the gospel every day because we forget the gospel every day. Yep. And I think that would be, if I were to add one thing, I would just say like actually being self-aware of the fact that you need to fight it because Again, on the theme of forgetfulness, you'll probably forget just how easily you'll for, you forget and you'll have this confidence that you really ought not have that you'll be fine. Going I'll be the few, one to remember. Yeah, yeah. I'll be fine going a few days without being grateful. I'll be fine going a few days without God's word in my life. I'll be fine going a few days without prayer. You know, he's close to me now. He, surely he can't get distant from me yeah, this that fade. quickly. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I would say be self-aware enough to know that you can forget <laughs> and then you can start fighting it. Yeah. Yeah. The first step to dealing with the problem is admitting there is one. Yeah. And so if I'm so self-assured that, well, everybody else forgets, but not me. Not me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> first, remember that you forget. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the second one is more on the topic of blaming, okay. right? Because first comes forgetfulness, then comes blaming. Yep. Yeah. Um, when, so I forget, I sin. Mm -hmm. And then when I realize I've sinned, oh, I don't want to deal with that. So I'm just going to blame you yeah, for so my I sin. start blaming. Yeah. Um, so what would be, again, thinking back to the passage, right? Aaron, Aaron blames the people. But if we're honest, the people did 
The people also, initiated. The people initiated. So Aaron's in the wrong, but the people are in the wrong too. Yep. So what would be a balanced perspective on, okay, how much of this is on my friend who maybe is a bad influence, right? There is genuinely something True. else Absolutely. pulling me into this sin and how much of it is still avoiding blame, yep. right? So I'm not, I'm not usurping responsibility or anything, but I'm also not just excusing yeah, I'm not, you know. Uh, for this, I I go to I go to addiction. Honestly, um, mm-hmm. I I have, I have family members who are praise God recovering, mm-hmm. and you know they've been sober for a certain number of years and things like that. I have friends mm-hmm. who are like that. I have family members who who battled addiction their whole life, uh, and you know battled alcoholism their whole life up until mm-hmm. the day they died. Um, and then I have family members who, who quit and, and mm-hmm. you know, maintain sobriety up until, uh, or freedom from their, their former addiction up until the day they died, uh, which is great. And, you know, one of the things that we frequently recognize with addiction is that it is a balance. And mm-hmm. so I think we need to take the same approach to, to understanding sin, right? Of, at the end of the day, I can't make you sin. Mm-hmm. Right. I can't. And we'll, we'll use alcoholism because uh, that's the one that I just I've seen in my own mm-hmm. genealogy and family tree and stuff the most. Right. Like you cannot force me mm-hmm. to consume alcohol. I mean, if you have a friend who is literally forcing you to sin, then yes, by all means, cut ties. But yeah. let's be honest, nobody's forcing you to sin. Yeah. And so there has to be that. OK, I can't blame you mm-hmm. for me getting blackout drunk every night. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That's on me. I'm making a personal decision to sin. Sin mm-hmm. is not accidental. You can't trip into sin. You mm-hmm. can't sin by proxy. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And so that's absolutely the blame that we talked about in the, in the passage. But to your question of what's the balance, just like with addiction, recognizing, okay, well, there are circumstances and situations that I can choose to not place myself in mm-hmm. that will significantly decrease the chance yeah. of me choosing that sin. Right. So you can't make me get blackout drunk. Mm-hmm. But if every single weekend you're like, hey, dude, come to the bar with me, mm-hmm. I can say no. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. no, because when I'm in that situation, I've exhibited a lack of self control. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to recognize that, dude, I love you, but you might not be the best influence in my life right now, right? right. If you want to hang out at my house in the backyard, cool, sweet. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to go with you to that place. Right. And so I'm not blaming you for my sin, but I'm recognizing that. You're not helping me in my fight against sin, mm-hmm. uh, right? So, uh, what are some of the examples I use in the in the sermon? Uh, we blame we blame situations, we blame external circumstances, right? I mean, goodness, these these are real life conversations. Well, I'm so angry because of mm-hmm. the news media. I'm so angry because of what people post online. Mm-hmm. Then stop going online. Mm-hmm. Like I. I'm not trying to be rude, but it's that simple, right? When I talk to people and they're like, well, I, I'm not angry until I go and I see all the dumb stuff people post on Facebook or on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Then stop going on Facebook and Twitter. Mm-hmm. Like, because you've demonstrated that you aren't going to exhibit self-control and a healthy yeah. temperate reaction. So it's not their fault that you sin in response. Mm-hmm. But if you can eliminate the exposure, yeah. great, do that, right? Uh, turn off the TV, mm-hmm. maybe don't start your day with talk radio where you, all you're doing is you're getting paid or you're, you're, you're not getting paid. You're listening to someone who gets paid based on how many people tune in. How do we get people to tune in mm-hmm. by being volatile and extreme, right? Yeah. Nobody tunes into the calm measured person who's just talking rationally and peacefully, right? Like mm-hmm. we tune into the more explosive personality. So naturally yeah. they're going to talk about things in a more explosive manner. Mm-hmm. Um, And so I think there's absolutely a balance of my sin is my sin. Mm. You did not make me sin. I cannot make you sin. So I'm not going to blame you for it. I'm not going to blame extenuating circumstances. I'm not going to blame this. Like I have to acknowledge it's my sin. Mm. And I have to acknowledge that there are people, there are things, there are places, there are situations, there are circumstances that tempt us. Mm. And so it's naive to say, well, I'm just going to continue to place myself in a more harmful potentially situation Mm. if I've already demonstrated it's, it's a temptation. Like no, then just remove that temptation from your life. I mean, what does scripture say in a very extreme example of this? Like if your right hand causes you to sin, 
cut it off. Mm. It'd be better to get into heaven one handed yeah. than in hell two handed. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, which we're not, but you get the, you get the nature of the warning. Like mm. we the have to view sin as something that's worth cutting off. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just the, the objectivity of it, being able to say, again, not pushing your sin onto someone else and saying, well, you made me do it. You caused me to do it. But also looking at that person and saying, but you did put me in a situation where I can objectively look and say, I was more tempted in that situation Absolutely. than if you hadn't put me in that situation. You know, so you're, you're objectively looking at your friend, acknowledging that they had a part in it. Yep. But you're also looking at yourself and saying, ultimately, I was the deciding factor. So I'm going to remove myself so from this, from this and situation. And that's the tactic I would say, right? Because I've had people ask me about this. Well, how do I say to a friend I'm cutting you off? I, I yeah. mean, it's really hard. Like, how do I say to my alcoholic parent, we're not bringing the kids around at Christmas anytime, mm -hmm. right? Like, because it's going to blow up. And it's like, how do you, like, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to get in a fight with you and I'm going to be screaming. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I'll always present it as the, like, Hey, I'm not going to go out with you because you're a bad influence on me. Like, mm -hmm. no, you know what? Hey, man, I really like this friendship and I care about you. But I've realized that when I place myself in this situation, I don't respond to it well. Mm -hmm. And so I can't tell you what to do. So if, if you're going to choose to put yourself in that situation, okay. Mm -hmm. But I can at least say I'm not going to put myself in that situation. Yeah, you know, I'm not I mean? going like, to be there with you. I'm not going to be there with you. Mom, I love you. Dad, I love you. But some of the decisions you're choosing to make have created a volatile situation that I that I don't want to respond and sin to, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know what? We're not going to come around this holiday season because I think that's what's best for my holiness. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like recognize like recognizing that how we choose to communicate this to people can either help them understand where we're coming from or it can put them on the defensive. Yeah. And and so we're never trying to do that and, and just uh, to go back to what we talked about in the sermon, right? We're never trying to make someone think that like, Hey, it's your fault. I'm sinning, mm -hmm. but we're also not afraid to say, I'm going to remove myself from the situation. I love you, but I, I can't put myself in that same circumstance. Yeah. I'm going to avoid sin so effectively that, yeah, I'm going to pull myself I'm gonna out, pull myself out of something <laughs> yeah. that we used to do yeah. every, you know, every night for years or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, good questions. Uh, so the reading, the reading quickly, you've got 2 Samuel 12. This one, this chapter was really driven by the middle point of the message. Mm -hmm. God's faithfulness does not mean we're free from consequence. Consequences don't mean God's not faithful. Mm -hmm. um, you see David dealing with the consequences of his sin. Mm -hmm. And what I love about it is that David praises the Lord. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the chapter not literally culminates, there's some verses after it, but in the story it it emotionally culminates with David praising the Lord and worshiping God because mm -hmm. he recognizes that he's dealing with the consequences of his sin. And that doesn't mean that God is any less worthy of worship. Uh, right. So I love second Samuel for that judges two. You really have all three. Mm -hmm. You've got blame. You've got personal responsibility. You've got consequences of sin. You've got God's faithfulness and God's mercy. You, you've got it all in judges too. So hopefully you see that. And then Psalm 89 um, has a little bit of consequences of sin, mm -hmm. But Psalm 89, and the reason I put it at the end is one, it comes last of those three chapters, but you'll notice that 2 Samuel comes after Judges, and I still recommended starting with mm -hmm. 2 Samuel. Uh, Psalm 89, I put it at the end because Psalm 89 is so much about God's faithfulness and mm -hmm. his steadfast love. And so just like I said in the message, look, we need to be able to be convicted and deal with the reality of our sin, but don't let the enemy turn it into a cynical spiral of pessimism. Mm -hmm. And so I think yeah. Psalm 89 ending with that should hopefully guard against that spiral in our own lives. Yeah. Yeah. To quote uh, Martin Luther again, just because I was trying to find that quote earlier. So I read a bunch of them, but he, he also used to say that when the enemy would whisper in his ear that he's a sinner, it would be a comforting thought because Christ Jesus came to save sinners, <laughs> you know? So I would say, ending on that note of faithfulness, you can keep in mind, I've seen consequences, right? I've dealt with actual consequences. I can't blame anyone else, but wow, by the grace of God, he came to save people like me who yep. face consequences, who can't blame their sin on other people, who 
just have to accept it, you know? I'll go to a modern day theologian. Uh, the the hip hop artist KB has a line in one of his songs talking about the enemy. He says, when he brings up your past, man, bring up your future, mm. you know? And, and that's that great juxtaposition that I think is valuable for Christians. Um, that's what we've got. If you have any questions, any comments, we'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, we'll see you Sunday. See you. Hey everyone, Pastor Sam, thanks so much for joining us on a midweek conversation. We hope it challenged you, encouraged you, kept this past Sunday's message at the front of our hearts and minds throughout the week. As always, if you have questions or comments you'd like us to discuss, please let us know. Otherwise, you can find more content like this here on our channel. Make sure you subscribe to stay up to date, and we'll see you next time.